We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 8 through 15. If you have your Bible with you or the Bible app on your phone or device, uh, feel free to turn there and follow along as I read. Um, you can also listen along as well. Luke 2, starting in verse 8. This is a familiar passage to probably many of us around this time of year, but it's always good to hear one more time. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields. I can't be lioness from peanuts, sorry, but you can picture that in your mind if you want to. I just watched that the other day, anyway. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Would you join me in prayer as we continue? Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, we have access to it. Thank you for revealing to us your character and who you are and showing us the state of our life, that we are empty and uh, lacking of all meaning without your presence in our life. Father, help us to see what your spirit wants us to hear and to take in with these words that we just read and that we just heard. Father, we ask that you translate the words that we just read from the text that we just saw and the words that we just heard to the everyday details of our life. Your word promises to be powerful and it's, a, it's, it's life-giving and we ask that you would uh, make that known in our life today. It's by the power of your spirit and through your son Jesus that we pray that. Amen. See which one of these maybe strikes your life. Bickering politicians. Disagreeing citizens with elected leaders. A country that's war-torn. Unjust laws and policies. Passive-aggressive comments by a boss at work or a coworker, Diseases that seem to never disappear. Draining cancer treatments. Weather phenomena that destroy homes and take lives. Discomfort with our own understanding of our own bodies. Gender dysphoria, attraction to the opposite sex, feelings of insufficiency, constant anxiety, divorce, the break of a, of a romantic relationship, the severing of a friendship, segregation from a community, feeling unwanted, feeling unworthy, feeling ashamed. There's probably many more you could uh, fill in the blank there. But it's no secret that we notice that our lives seem to always be caught in a constant war. Torn from God, torn from others, torn from our own understanding of our very self, torn from everything else in life. In a world with such division, we long for peace. We sing about peace at this time of the year. It's filled with the movies that we watch. It's filled with the cards that we send out. But we all still long for it. As much as we talk about it, we often wonder where it is in our own life. In a world filled with such division, we just want the messes, the disasters, the conflicts to stop, to cease. And the absence of something, fill in the blank, whatever that is, is often what we mean by peace. Meaning, if only fill in the blank was gone, I'd be at peace. If only blank would go away, then I'd be, then I'd have peace. We think of peace in terms of removing something, but what if peace is less about removal and more about filling? What we encounter in the life of Jesus is that he brings peace by filling the world with himself. The reality is that the world is war-torn because it is missing the presence of God. What the world needs is to be filled with God's presence. This is what the angels announced to the shepherds in Luke 2. The angels' announcement in Luke 2 describes a fulfillment of our longing for peace. 
But the peace described in Luke 2 is different than a sense of peace that is just the absence of mess and chaos. Rather, Luke 2 describes how the birth of Jesus, God's incarnation, God made flesh on earth, reveals a sense of peace that is all-encompassing. It's a peace that is filled with something substantial, not just the absence of something. The angels announce a peace on earth that is filled with God's presence in the flesh and blood life of Jesus. Peace on earth has come. Peace on earth is God's presence in the life of Jesus. Peace on earth has come. Peace on earth is God's presence in the life of Jesus. Human death is revealing about reality in a lot of different ways. It's the moment that a person is eternally united to God or eternally separated from God. It's the moment that a person is separated from those who remain alive. It's the moment when the human body is overtaken by the rest of creation, returning to the dust of the earth and decomposition happening. Where the rest of creation overtakes the distinction of the human body. It's also the moment where the self is separated from the body, leaving a lack of cohesion. Uh, many of you know my, my grandma just passed recently, and as often happens at some funerals, you have a viewing and you see the person after they've passed. And my mom had even noted to me that, you know, it looks like grandma, but you also know it's not her. Like, there's just something that's not all there. Like, the body looks like the person, but there's also just, you know, my grandma-ness isn't there. Like, the, the thing that makes her her is not there. There's a lack of cohesion. There's a lack of fullness, even though there's a body there. But death reveals, like, you know, there's, there's something missing there. All of the division that we experience in life, division between ourselves and God, division between ourselves and each other, division between ourselves and our very understanding of ourselves, and division between ourselves and the rest of creation, all of these divisions show up in the moment when Adam and Eve separate themselves from God, which we encounter in Genesis chapter 3. There we encounter that Adam and Eve become at odds with God. Adam and Eve become at odds with each other. They blame each other for the choices that they make. Adam and Eve become at odds with their own understanding of who they are. They feel shame and don't know what to do with their naked state of existence. Adam and Eve become at odds with the rest of creation. They use leaves for clothing instead of the, the things from trees to, to have food. F trees aren't for food. Now, now they're for, for clothing themselves. Like There's a whole like, difference of what we do with, they do with creation there. They even become, become at odds with the serpent at that point on. And many of us probably still have that same fear. We don't want to see a snake at all. They soon become at odds with the childbirth process, as well as needing to contend with the rest of creation to grow food and survive. The disharmony and conflict of life began when humans separated themselves from God. The disharmony and conflict of life began when humans removed God's presence from life on earth. A lack of peace is tied to a lack of God's presence in our life. Peace on earth is a result of God's presence being reunited to the life we enjoy here on earth. Peace on earth is God's presence revealed in the life of Jesus. It's one thing for me to tell any of you or to say to anybody that racism should stop. And that might have some weight depending on if you know me or not know me. But it's quite another to hear those words articulated by Martin Luther King Jr., for Martin Luther King Jr., the words stop racism hold a gravity that my words just don't have. Martin Luther King Jr. suffered racism, persevered through it, and actively loved people who perpetuated it. It does indeed make a difference who utters words that just anybody can say. But why does the concept of peace hold such gravity with the life of Jesus? And why do the angels connect the coming of Jesus as the coming of peace on earth? Later in Jesus' life, after he's been crucified and resurrected, in John chapter 20, we encounter Jesus meeting with his disciples in a closed-door room. And Jesus all of a sudden shows up there and addresses them by saying, Peace be with you. Notice here that Jesus equates peace to himself. It's only by him appearing in that moment that he's saying, Peace has now come. What Jesus reveals to his disciples and to us 
is that his peace is not just some inner feeling of tranquility. Rather, the peace of Jesus is the presence of God himself in the life of Jesus. The peace of Jesus is God's presence on earth in the life of Jesus. The peace of Jesus is the goodness of God displacing the brokenness of life. So filling it up with his goodness, if you will. He's not taking something out. He's filling it up with his goodness and then it overflows into the rest of life. It's God's goodness displacing the chasm between us and God. It's God's goodness displacing the chasm between us and each other. It's God's goodness displacing the chasm between us and our very understanding of ourselves. It's God's goodness displacing the chasm between us and the rest of creation. We can see how Jesus is peace and how the scriptures describe what the peace of God is. The Old Testament scriptures describe the coming of a Messiah or Savior figure, the person who's to redeem the world from sin and death and make creation all that it was intended to be in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Israel's prophets give glimpses of who and what the Messiah would be. One such prophet, Isaiah, describes the coming Messiah in this way in Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Another prophet, Micah, describes the Messiah by saying this in Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites." He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. You see even there the connection of the coming Messiah, or who we eventually know as Jesus, as being this peace that we long for. In the Old Testament, the general word for peace is the word shalom. According to Bible professor Perry Yoder, shalom has multiple shades of reference. So it's kind of like a diamond. You can kind of turn it and see different facets of it from the the way you look at it. It can pertain to material or physical well-being. That's one way of looking at what shalom means or what peace means in the Old Testament. So talking about the health condition of a person or a building or something like that. It can also pertain to the relational well-being of, of people. So people feeling good about their relationship with each other and having harmony with each other, or nations having harmony with each other, if you will. It can also pertain to moral well-being. So our relationship with God, and our relationship with God then impacting how we relate to each other. What this reveals is that biblically, peace is not just the absence of something, like the absence of conflict. Rather, it is a positive movement toward a whole and full life. Further, in the multiple shades of how shalom appears in the Old Testament, there is a trace continuity among all of these shades. A biblical sense of shalom or peace is never at the exclusion of one shade or the other. So, peace is never at the expense of someone's physical well-being, nor is it ever at the expense of relational well-being, nor is it ever at the expense of moral well-being. If you don't have moral well-being, you're not going to have relational well-being. If you don't have relational well-being, you're probably not going to have physical well-being. They all kind of impact each other in one way or the other. Biblical peace always holds the shades of material, relational, and moral well-being in tension with each other. In the Old Testament, this can be seen in the prophets' critique of the false prophets. False prophets were critiqued for equating shalom with material well-being alone. So they equated like, well, you have peace if you have, you know, prosperity, essentially. But the prophets pointed out that this materialistic shalom was always at the expense of another's bodily or relational poverty. So someone had to be short of something for you to have the peace that they were talking about. 
We whitewash the peace taught in the Bible when we think we can have peace without care, compassion, mercy, and justice and direct connection to God. If we're disconnected from God, we're going to be disconnected from each other. If we're disconnected from God, we're going to be disconnected from everything else that we interact with on earth. Turning to the New Testament, we see what it says there about peace in this way. Peace in the New Testament is, is this term, uh, Irene, in the Greek language. And it's very much informed by the Old Testament word, shalom. Perry Yoder again notes that Irene is used in much the same way as shalom for material and physical well-being as well as good relationships and moral character. However, the peace in the New, in the New Testament refers to, um, is, differs from shalom in one distinctive way. It is used theologically. That is, it is used of God as in the phrase, the God of peace, or the peace of God, or the peace of Christ. These expressions show that in the New Testament, peace came to have an important theological meaning. It was used to talk about God and the good news of God for mankind. It is used to refer to the results of Jesus' death, life, and resurrection. In other words, in the New Testament, peace is the result of the re-emerging presence of God in and through the life of Jesus. All that the New Testament talks about peace, it's all referring to the life of Jesus. The New Testament writers describe how Jesus' birth, life, death, and resurrection bring about peace in very distinctive ways. It brings about peace between us and God, us and each other, and us and our own understanding of ourselves, as well as us and the rest of creation. We will briefly look at this last uh, way, uh, peace between us and the rest of creation here in a moment. But these other facets, uh, Mike and Mitch Knight are going to help us reflect on that in the coming weeks as we kind of tease out this whole idea of peace on earth. The past year plus has been an ongoing experience of the disharmony and lack of peace that we encounter with the rest of creation. COVID has brought into focus that human life and flourishing is threatened by other aspects of creation. I mean, this last year plus has just been like, a, we're just living through the, oh yeah, creation is at odds with us, and, and we're at odds with the rest of creation. But also realizing like we are created beings as well, like we are not infinite, we are not, like we are finite people, we are dependent on God to provide for us, we are made in his image, we are created beings just like the rest of creation. We just happen to have his image that makes us different. And while I, I don't pretend to know the ins and outs of how diseases emerge and evolve, like how one comes about and how it goes away, what I do know is that the very term disease indicates a lack of something. In this case, if you just look at the etymology of the word, it means the lack of ease, <laughs> which seems pretty simple. <laughs> diseases are an indicator that something is lacking in life. We see, in this, we see this same situation with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Two of the ramifications that Adam and Eve experienced after separating themselves from God are pain during childbirth, a lack of ease, and toil while working the ground, a lack of ease. I'm not saying that pain during childbirth and toil while working are diseases as we think of diseases, but those two difficulties are a result of something lacking. A lacking that came from being separated from God's presence. The Apostle Paul makes a similar note in Romans 8, verses 19 through 22, where he says, For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. The Apostle Paul here describes creation as dealing with decay and the bondage that comes from that decay. So a lack of something. That's what decay is, right? Stuff's just disappearing, if you will. Creation is dealing with the ramifications of God's presence being separated from the created realm. And that happened all the more when the humans who are to care for creation became separated from God. When humans lack God's presence, that lack of presence trickles down into human interaction with the rest of creation. 
There is supposed to be a harmony between the created uh, beings of humanity and the rest of creation. But our separation from God has hindered the harmony, that harmony from coming about. And that separation from God has snowballed into greater disharmony as history has unfolded. This is what some refer to as the butterfly effect. Like if you do something here, it eventually kind of trickles its way around the world, which we haven't seen that at all again this last past year plus. But it goes to show like one thing as it snowballs throughout history, it's like hard to unwind it at that point. But it all traces back to our separation from God's presence. But the hope that Paul offers to creation's groaning is that God's presence will once again be reunited with creation when the children of God are revealed. See verse 19. And the child, and one specific child of God that makes that possible is Jesus. Jesus, God's son, is the one who enters into creation. He takes on created flesh and heals the disharmony between humans and the rest of creation. He reinserts God's presence into life. What was made lacking when humanity separated itself from God is now filled with God bringing God's presence back into created life. The peace that Jesus brings is not just the notion of maintaining the status quo, but just without conflict. No, that's not at all what the peace of Jesus is about. The peace that Jesus brings is well-being to us, to others, and to the rest of creation. The the message of the angels in Luke 2 captures that Jesus is the fulfillment of the messianic promise of peace. The angels are saying that Jesus himself is peace and fleshed and lived out. Paul affirms this reality in Ephesians 2 verse 14. When he says, for he, speaking of Jesus, he himself is our peace. The reality of peace finds its origin and expression in Jesus. Jesus can bring peace to the world because he is the very essence and embodiment of what peace is. So as much as the world around us talks about peace, they may not know it, but they're at least indicating something about who God is because we can have no understanding of what peace is separated from God. It may be very sh- a shallow understanding of it, but only when we look at Jesus do we see the full picture of what peace looks like. Peace on earth has indeed come. Peace on earth is God's presence in the life of Jesus. Peace on earth has come. Peace on earth is God's presence in the life of Jesus. Where do you need peace in your life today? Whatever that area is, it's only God's presence that we encounter in the life of Jesus that will fill that void. Today, I invite you to respond to this message by simply believing, maybe for the first time or maybe for the thousandth time, that Jesus is the peace that we long for. Believe that Jesus is the peace that you long for. And if you've never taken the first step to encounter or and surrender, Jesus to, uh, surrender your life to Jesus, I invite you to connect with me or any other adult or a person in here who uh, you have a trusting relationship with And I'm sure they would love to help walk you through that first step of being united to the life of Jesus and being baptized and immersed into into that way of life and beginning that journey of choosing to believe that he is our peace, that Jesus is our peace. Peace on earth has come. Peace on earth is God's presence in the life of Jesus. Will you join me in prayer as we close? Father God, thank you for revealing your son to us and revealing who you are to us through him. Thank you that we've been given your peace. Thank you that we see the clearest indicator of what peace is by the life of your son. Father, show us where we need peace in our life and help us to entrust our life to you and allow you to put your peace into our life, to fill our life where that that void is. Father, help us to believe and to persevere in that belief, even when it's hard to believe that you are our peace and that you are the peace that we long for. It's by the power of your spirit and through your son Jesus that we pray this. Amen.